Yeah. And we're recording. Okay. I see we have 16 people and I'm seeing some folks from Plexus World, some people from Visual World. So this is kind of a fun combination of how we all think and approach ideas. So this will be uh, hopefully quite a rich conversation. I, I, Amanda, I think it's, it's time. Let's go. Go for it. But people will show up. Um, and uh, yes, there you go. <laughs> um, so we are recording the conversation and it'll be available on the Plexus Institute channel on YouTube so that if you come across any ideas that um, uh, you can go back and look at them again. And we encourage everybody to mute yourself until you are speaking and we will be asking you to speak. And um, we thought it would be kind of good to mention how Amanda and I met each other, which is many years ago at a Plexus conference. And Amanda was drawing and I was sort of drawing um, and we were like two peas in a pod in what we were interested in at the time, which was teaching creativity and how we ended up at Plexus, which was interested in um, applying complexity science to human organizations. We sort of knew we were in the right place. And then we ran into each other again at the International Forum of Visual Practitioners Conference. And so for many years, I think at least eight, Amanda and I have been carrying on a really interesting conversation about visuals and complexity science. And um, we thought it would be a really nice time to open up this conversation and start looking at, um, there was a request in the Portland workshop that Kelvy ran to come up with a lexicon of um, images for systems, which is not quite complexity. Um, that's one level down. And we just thought this would be a great opportunity that Plexus has um, lovely vocabulary list on its website, plexusinstitute.com. Is org. that correct? Yes. Org. Huh? Dot org. Dot org. It's dot org. So it's worth exploring the Plexus Institute site for those of you who are new. Um, at plexusinstitute.org, there's also a really lovely complexity primer. And for those of you who are thinking in systems, um, my professor who taught me about complexity, it's like systems can be diagrammed and complexity can be not. You can't model complexity. I, the other way that um, I was taught this is that um, near us in Washington is the ship that goes and deals with humanitarian disasters, the Good Hope. And all of the systems involved in gathering all of the people, the doctors who have to take time off from their work and then finding replacements and um, putting all the equipment on the ship and the supplies and even the food and all of that, that's a systems thing. And that's complicated. But when you land on the ground at the humanitarian disaster, that's complex. And so that there's this difference in looking at complicated and then complex. And so we're now going to be working in the complex realm. And one of the things that happens in complex adapted systems is that things, there are a couple of things that I thought just really quickly to do a very, very quick set of, of one of the things that we're dealing with is that, so the scientific nomenclature for say, a positive reinforcing feedback loop looks something like that. And then the scientific nomenclature for a negative feedback loop, which could also be called a balanced feedback, looks something like that. And so, well, that's kind of not helpful to have the two of those looking so similar. 
So one of our first images that we came up with is the idea of a balancing feedback loop. Yeah, the, the arrows are pointing at each other, but it's balanced. It's not just arrows. And then a, a, a reinforcing not balanced feedback loop looks like this because it gets out of control pretty quickly. And um, the other thing that, we're, that, that um, we wanted to mention is that one of the things going on with Plexus, and we're at this moment of um, creativity as a group, is that a year ago, we had our first Plexus conference. Um, and after the conference, a core group of us got very, very, very excited about what will Plexus be? We, we feel like Plexus had gone into hibernation and it was ready to emerge. How would it emerge? And as we were having these conversations, Amanda's contributions were visual and illustrative. And everybody realized that the visuals were integral to the conversation because it brought in other understandings so that we're not just providing documentation of what had been said, but in fact, actually propelling the conversation forward because it's an integral part of what does it feel like to be part of this group. And so I will turn this over to you, Amanda, and ask you, have I covered what we wanted as the opening? Awesome, brilliant, yes. Yeah. Oh, what? Oh, uh, hi. Awesome, so I, my name is Amanda Lyons, and you've been hearing from Barb Siegel. Um, Barb is from Look to Listen. I'm from Visual Search Change, and we're both Plexus Catalysts. And I, um, yeah, I, I love the story that you told, and we've been having this conversation for a long time, as Barb shared. Um, so we're kind of excited to be stepping into this sort of Plexus 2.0 and the Plexus Network, which is really, for those of you who don't know, a big network of folks um, that is looking for and doing all kinds of things in applied complexity and really applying complexity. Um, and so I think we might just jump in rather than hearing a lot from us. So basically complexity, oh, uh, so many different ways that we could think about this and do it, but rather than step into an academic or scientific way of looking at it, we thought let's find a way to experience it together. And so rather than, because you know, to actually think about the mechanics and all of that would take a very long time. So in this hour, we have a question for you. Um, and, and before I jump into that question, I'm going to ask you to pull out that paper you have and that marker and go ahead and make a dot, make a line, <clears throat> draw a circle. Draw a squiggle. Don't have to follow the way that I'm doing it. And now, um, now that we've 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 reached a place where we feel like we can all draw, <laughs> as drawing is not necessarily about beauty, it can also be about really connecting and connecting to feeling, connecting to each other. And so, um, we are going to ask you to. Think about a system that you've been a part of in some way and a change that's happened. Change happens in a way that we can feel it, right? And you have this feeling sometimes that it's going to be successful and you just, you just feel that, right? So our first challenge for you is to draw that feeling, the awareness of that moment. Draw the awareness of the moment of change. Go ahead and take another 30 seconds if you need it. For those of you who have just popped in, welcome. Good to see so many of you. If you didn't hear, go ahead and write your name and email. 
and sort of why, why, where you're coming from and why you're interested in today in the chat. And then when folks are ready, what we're actually going to have people do is to share your name and a short version of your story of change and hold up if you have a video or describe your drawing if you don't. And we're going to also ask you to take photos of them and share them with us as well. Um, but we would love to sort of hear what you all, what it feels like to go through change via your drawing. Yeah, Nancy, you're going to jump in and go first. I'm going to unmute. I don't you. follow. I don't follow sequential uh, instructions. So if I forget to do something you ask me to do, remind me. Well, so there's then. my moment of change. And I can't remember what else I was supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> your moment of change. Tell us about your moment of change a little bit. Um, a moment of change is usually about either an opening or narrowing of possibilities, and disfocusing of cameras. <laughs> Bring it down a little. Yeah, it's just yeah. It's, this is my camera. Okay. Um, and uh, signaling moments of change often starts with an unconscious awareness, not necessarily a conscious awareness or an intuitive, not always data driven. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. And is there something else? Yeah, great. Thank you. Who else wants to jump in? Wendy? When do you want to jump in? Awesome. I'm going to keep going. Cheryl? Sure. I don't, does my microphone work? Can you hear me? Yeah. I have another question. Okay. Um, so that's my moment of change. It's kind of a felt like a cliff, like, um, oh, we're falling off the cliff, uh, but a new sort of um reality below okay. awesome thanks looks like wendy's in the library all good if you want to type in you're welcome to <laughs> jessica you jump in i just find my unmute button yeah. um so mine is kind of like messy and then not so messy <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like confusion and clarity. Maybe, maybe that. Awesome. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like Cheryl's cliff a little bit different. <laughs> cool. John? Can I unmute? Yep. I am unmuted, yes. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, um, well, my change is um, uh, many, many years ago um, when I was working at the University of Edinburgh, um, my boss was concerned about uh, the expenses I was consuming in going into conferences for continuing education. And he and I were actually having lunch one day. I can show you this. Um, oh, it's... Wait a minute, it's a mirror image. <laughs> mm -hmm. If I could show you this. Um, we were having lunch, and um, I'd just come back from a, a meeting where all the evidence of fetal monitoring obstetrics was um, displayed in detail. And, and he said to me, yes, yes, the evidence sounds convincing, but does it really work? Mm -hmm. And I said, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, what, what, what did the audience think? you know, when they were outside of the classroom. And that's when, um, and, and when I then came to Canada and I started to look around at this and I met Etienne Wenger, then it all sort of came together, a little concept of social learning. Um, but, uh, you know, again, reflecting on what you can predict and the conversation before between, uh, between um, systems and, and complexity reminds me of, I think it was Brenda Zinnemann that says, it's the difference between throwing a stone and throwing a bird. Uh, and, and I think that's um, very significant. 
People have rearranged in my video spot. How about, did we do Jennifer yet? A video. Hi. Hi. Um, so mine was very simple and can be described. I have intentionally uh, disabled my camera for the time being, not just for this call, but in general. Um, and mine is an exclamation point. So I was uh, reading Tom's comment about a language uh, describing his as a spark. Uh, mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like we might have some parallels uh, in our thinking, but I was just embodying that in a, or representing that in a simple exclamation point, um, kind of capturing the energy and spontaneity uh, of that notion of change, which may lead in any direction. Nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that mic showing up as William? Do I have that right? Yes. Hi. So I didn't follow directions uh, because I experienced non-change today at my organization where we have a new five-year plan that is essentially like the other five-year plan mm. that we just came off of. So my picture is of a snake eating its own tail. Uh, <laughs> and that's not very evolutionary or particularly productive, but um, it was uh, unfortunately kind of predictable too. So non-change is also, uh, I think, a reflection of um, how complex systems maybe sometimes don't work mm -hmm. to engender change. Yeah, it's not always a positive thing. Thanks. Hi, I have, um, so let's see if we can see this. Can you see this? Give me one second. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I was trying to do three things. Um, one, sort of the, the little purple dot is the essence of, of who you are or me. And there's a fractal quality because we really do bring with us everything that's happened in the past, but we enter new places or ecosystems and those change us. And then there are some times that we take these sort of quantum leaps from one stage to another and none of it is, even though there are some linear lines in there, it's all very messy. And you move around each of those spaces in a way that, um, sort of influences how you change too. Very cool. Thank you, Dean. I have one. Yeah. Um, I sort of see it as you sense the change, but the environment is is the same environment, and so that change is is the noticing of the opportunity and going with that as opposed to staying within the same environment. Awesome. Dean. Dean. Hello everyone. I'm 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 here but I don't know how long I'll be here but I will I will jump in and offer um change for me i'm very i'm very interested in cycles um just because i have a strong feeling about how systems operate and um in this case there's a sense of potential iteration um and yet modification as we go through cycles or as one goes through cycles um and change has a massive quantity of the unknown um change may actually be reversed or brought back, uh, but, or it may lead uh, to a completely different direction. Awesome, thank you. Erin? Hi, so mine is, uh, that's 
So it's like you're moving along a point, thinking you're heading in one direction, and then project work gets, um, maybe through research, you understand a lot of points of view, you know, a lot of people start um, being involved, and there's always these points of like, what's going on? <laughs> where are we going? And then there's kind of like clarity and a breaking point of where a new direction goes. Mm. Yeah. So for you, that change was that break point, that moment of the break point or the complexity right before? Yeah, I think like you're understanding the change and the complexity and like all of this energy moving around you. But yeah, to me, it was like that breaking point where, um, um, things become quite clear and a new direction is um, decided on. Which of course then starts the other cycle of like, what's going on? <laughs> <clears throat> awesome, thank you. Um, Labog? Hi. Um, yeah, my... Uh, story of change was one of uh, being the company we're in is recently acquired and so there's a fairly um, a robust change on the horizon so, so the image was fairly simple of a sun just peeking over the horizon with the road leading out um, unknowns on the other side but some suggestive uh, change and context. Awesome. Thank you. Maya? Hi, sorry, I can't fully participate. I'm mostly listening. <laughs> awesome. Kim? Maybe Kim is in the same boat. No audio or video. Do you want to type in, Kim? If you haven't already and I missed it. Brilliant. Danielle? Okay. Or Linda, I think is the last. Just give a second. Listening. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. Um, well, then we're going to do this to taking this now to the next level of, I saw a lot of really interesting images, um, some of which really are resonating with me a lot. And this is an opportunity to go back to that initial request of draw draw what it feels like in that moment of change. Like what does that moment of change feel like emotionally? And um, based on all of these images that we've seen and, and hearing people's stories, um, you, may, you may choose the same moment of change because many of us have worked in change and are, are um, change consultants, but it may be that the images have changed for you what that feels like, that something resonated with you that you hadn't noticed before. So we're going to invite you to go back and do a second drawing, having heard what everyone else said.
Does anyone want to share? Erin, would you like to share? You look like you're done drawing. Um, so where my previous drawing was uh, more kind of lateral time, this one is like looking forward. So you're like in the drawing looking uh, into time. And so there's like a lot of like moving past the kind of confusion and having clarity in the single point where you're going. Is that the oh. like point where things are suddenly clear again? Thank you. I love that you changed the viewpoint. That's yeah. yeah. I'm going to share one more. I'm going to be the overachiever, but <laughs> this one yeah. I did was a door. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to one up everybody now. Everybody's <laughs> drawing their second one now. <laughs> cool, thanks. I've got my second one. <laughs> uh, I was thinking that my change um, seemed really positive, but I think sometimes you can go from this is super colorful, not as colorful, and this is where we were originally. And it can feel not super colorful to be in change. Uh -huh. um, or it can feel super colorful and positive, but change isn't always um, a feel good place. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Nancy. You know, I didn't really follow the instructions. <laughs> Shocking, um, and 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 mine was more to notice um, that the visuals were very different than what I would call graphic recording visuals, which are about icons, and more about patterns and shapes. So things that showed motion, things that showed inflection points, things that showed multiple perspectives, versus you know, kind of the literal stuff, which I just dropped everything on the floor now. <laughs> Oh man, really everything. <laughs> yes, thank you. Mike, you look, you look. Yes, um, you, you're very perceptive. I was bringing it up. So this um, is a, uh, a group of individuals that are kind of uh, together and then a change happens and each kind of finds their way and eventually they come back into uh, swimming together. So that's the change as they're kind of together, then they go looking around, getting information, then coming back together again. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> John? I'm on new to it, am I? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I was thinking when Erin showed her first diagram, um, you see that? Uh, oh, gee, it is upside down. Mm. Not sure why. But, um, and when, when the change occurs, um, there's sort of uh, a lot of uncertainty and instability, etc., happening here. And then eventually you get, to, when, when he was showing this, I was thinking, yeah, this is the problem with the leaders who are so stable in their, in their initial initiative, but when they see the complexity and the, the, the instability occurring here, the, the pressure to remain uh, in the status quo is, is, is part, of, part of this uncertainty that's happening here. And I am physically reacting to those two arrows. I mean, I actually feel it in my back. Just that captured something for me so strongly. <laughs> Thank you. 
let's see. Mike? No, you've already gone. Um, Cheryl, did you go? Um, I haven't gone yet. So where I had my sort of linear cliff before, um, now it's a bit more of a complex path to get there. And then from there, it's this jumping off into this opening, this like light moment, um, this more clear path that I think will include uh, up in this corner over here, more squiggles and more uncertainty um, as we move forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, so I like Kim, Maya, Tom, and anybody who is there that wants to, um, your cameras are off, but if you want to just add to the chat, um, yeah, Tom, that would be really valuable. Tom and Wendy have to um, change okay. this image, like a telescope you see in a Dr. Seuss book, front end really small, like a bottleneck, and on the other end, huge, representing the myriad opportunities that are out there, very freeing. Wendy's became smoother overall. Awesome. Can I also just say these are awesome. I, I feel a little bit like I'm I've gotten stuck in the logistics, um, so I haven't been able to sort of say like these are really cool. Thank you guys for jumping in and just drawing things out. And it's a little bit it takes some courage and a little bit of a struggle sometimes to even be like, okay, I have to step into this moment of change and actually put it on a piece of paper. What? So thanks for jumping in. Actually, yes, because I want to show what happens when I hear and draw at the same time. I was really, really moved by this concept of, um, no, it's my hand that we should spotlight. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I was very moved by um, Denise's concept of the fractal nation of, notion of the self and also um, Aaron's notion of the gap that there's this gap between that the moment of change is that gap, which really resonated quite a lot for me. And then I'm still kind of sticking with the concept of that the environment is the environment. But now actually um, with Tom's arrows, which really, 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 I physically felt them because that is part of if you are in a change environment where you're being asked to change, it's true that a lot of things are external and that is not beyond the environment, that's power with others. So that resonated quite a bit with me. Thank you. Um, and so we have, a, um, we, we, have another drawing or so before we jump into that Barb, yeah i i, I want to sort of piggyback off of what nancy said and and ask if anybody has any other sort of thoughts around the patterns that we've seen um and and anything that sort of came up for them as they were moving from one to the other and um you know anything else that has sort of come up as you're stepping through this exercise um, and so the opportunity to throw that in the chat as well as have a couple people speak maybe just to make the best use mm -hmm. of our time since mm -hmm. there's a fair amount of us here would be awesome we'd love to sort of hear that from folks so we're going popcorn style just jump in if you want to jump in and or type it out oh uh, yeah this is steve so <clears throat> uh briefly you know uh after seeing other people's drawings there was a, a general sense of kind of the abstract chaos uh in the sense of how do we articulate a feeling either through an object or through um relationship between people uh or as a context you know are, are you are you talking about the uh do, does the context provide the perspective like who's looking at it or who's involved in it mm -hmm. uh, and I had changed from initially drawing this landscape to drawing pieces of a puzzle that all had different shapes and different patterns and you're kind of wondering how do they fit together uh, so it was kind of a maybe different lenses and different uh, perspectives that could be involved awesome thank you 
I'm not sure who it was, and maybe it was you, Nancy, who talked about change being intuitive and this intent, uh, <clears throat> something then that we are feeling versus seeing, and that um, it's not always data driven. And I feel like that's so important um, to understand because we're um, really doing, especially how these drawings are really great tools to share what that change feels like because it is very emotional for us and is not a set of numbers on a graph. So have you ever looked at the work of Linda Berry? Mm -mm. L-Y-N-D-A Berry. Um, she used to be a cartoonist but now she teaches, I think at Wisconsin, I can't remember. Yes. But she does a, um, a thing called Spiral Journal, which asks you to draw a spiral before you start doing your analysis. And often there's some music playing. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it seems to attune people's brains differently so that they can pay attention to different kinds of signals because data is one kind of signal or mm -hmm. data are one kind of signal. I'll screw that up. English language is really fun. Um, uh, emotions are signals. Intuitions are signals. And when working in complexity, this idea that we're sensing and probing versus mining data, particularly in this era where we seem to worship data analytics, um, mm -hmm. requires people to shift out. And visuals, in my mind, help people shift out of that stance. Um, they give permission to utilize everything that's in the different parts of our brain and as our cognition is situated through our body. So it could also be movement. Um, it could be singing. I mean, it depends. Um, so the, the idea for me is that change, the signals of change may often be non-factual before they're factual. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that sensing stuff and it really fascinates me and particularly when you're working with very intellectual or academic or very highly professionalized groups getting to that space where they've given themselves permission to acknowledge it and the spiral journal has been really interesting except for really type a personalities to say that was a freaking waste of time however you can tell this type a personalities that there's a lot of research done on how drawing spirals actually helps cross hemisphere communication and um it's one of the things that is is being discussed in uh, education mm -hmm. realm that they're no longer teaching cursive writing and yet cursive writing has a lot of loops in it and so that when we are in a data-driven world how do we access data that is felt not data and, uh, and you know our 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 intuition our feelings our our body sensing our somatic awareness that is data but it's often denied and it comes into the body through the right hemisphere and um the way that the two hemispheres work is that the left hemisphere the moment it takes over it's in charge because it's always right it is always right. And there's a wonderful book about the master and his emissary by, um, I can't remember, but it's called The Master and His Emissary about how the two hemispheres have different um, strategies for gathering information. And anything that is a tool that allows us to enable others to access the right hemisphere is a really valuable tool because almost all of society right now is using less left hemisphere modalities. Well, and you know, there's uh, the other brain research around that is the trium brain, which is the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And, you know, I always get the three mixed up, but I have a picture of it someplace. Um, but when I tell those type A people is to look around to the people in the room who said it was highly valuable, those are their direct reports and they're their managers. Mm. And for them to, to realize that they had such a completely different experience than the people who reported to them was the aha moment. Mm. Um, 
because they, it, it, and again, you know, thinking about these images, they're really, really a lot about in complexity. It's about multiple perspectives, not one perspective and not one perspective being right. If you move into the complicated and, you know, there may be a moment where one perspective is the dominant or right or best practice, but um, that in the complex domain, uh, you're allowed to go fishing. Which is hard for the type A managing type people. Yes. Find a link for that triumvirate. Well, there are a couple of ways you divide the brain. One is left, right, one is top, middle, bottom, and then there's front, back. So it's all in how you're, like what you're choosing to look at. Um, and keep up with the research. Yeah, <laughs> Mike? So um, I'm not actually responsible for my brain. Um, <laughs> you guys are. <laughs> so one of the things that I've noticed in brain research, um, being a geek and reading all that stuff, um, terrible stuff sometimes, some of it, is that um, there's a big discounting of social influences on the um, evolution of thinking and evolution of um, how we perceive things. So one of the things I like to point out is that we have um, evolved each other here through this process. So my brain now, um, if it be better or be it worse, is different <laughs> than when I started this conversation. Mm -hmm. But they do talk about that actually, that, um, that because the brain is connections, you know, they, they, that's the, the connectome, that the connectome is always changing. So, yeah. We yeah, have. The, connect, the connectome is always changing, but the re, it, it, historically, um, even consciousness was not considered a fit subject for research. That was mm -hmm. uh, philosophers and all this. And um, it wasn't even considered until recently that much of a fit subject to look at um, uh, nurture and uh, social influences. And there's a lot more research, research out than there used to be on how there is, uh, it's about consensus research, how uh, humans come together for consensus on what is a true red. It's different in some countries than others. Uh, what is the meaning of this word and how does a word evolve? And so there is the uh, brain that is the social brain, which is not contained in any individual person, but is contained in groups such as ours here and um, those that move around. And what we've done is, um, even though it's not contained within a particular bony structure, we do have, in my opinion, a... Uh, kind of a uh, plexus brain going on, even in this conversation. <laughs> Jessica, I'm kind of curious how all this is hitting you. Uh, I'm loving it. Um, it was funny, um, William's thought of my not responsible or my, my brain. Um, I have a five year old and he says that all the time. <laughs> and there's like, there's some, I don't know, there's something interesting for me, for me there. Um, and of course, I love hearing about um, brain science and how that affects how we view. Um, what's happening around us and whether the problem is complex or complicated or simple or multiple viewpoints, we'll all see the same things vastly differently. And um, I think in visualizing it, how do you, you know, bounce back and forth between all of those things? Um, is it, and if a drawing is, if you take a drawing and it's a social brain, like the drawing is the representation of the social brain. I, I'm just curious what that sort of, looks like well yeah and so this is really this is interesting so um 
I'm looking at what Amanda did and I'm going to critique it and say, I'm not feeling it. I'm seeing it, but I'm not feeling it yet. And some of what we got to, I really felt like, um, I think it was John's arrows. I mean, I'm, I, I had a very visceral reaction to that. And it was, it was, it was experience that I had had that, that I was pushing back from or whatever. And I, I think that, um, it's so difficult to communicate feeling that um, we have this tool to start talking about, well, what is red? And um, you know, get into that conversation because what does it feel like to be um, you know, feeling left out or um, you know, the emotion of fear. What does fear really feel like for you? Is it excitement? Is it fear? Is it this? And the drawing allows us to step outside of ourselves and start talking instead of using words, which is then through a different filter, but to actually use um, non-words to communicate things that don't have words to describe them, really. We, we have nomenclature, but we don't really, I mean, for us, everyone, fear is a different thing. Fear might be that, that I, I love being on the edge of the cliff, and for other people, they're standing 10 feet back. So one of my hobbies is to learn languages. And one of the interesting but frustrating parts of it, as I learn, Danish, German, and Spanish, is that as I'm learning them, I'm finding out that they're changing. So you have to, so I can't get a book like I had in college and expect to learn German because it has changed in the 40 years since I've been in college. Um, so even when you talk about words and facts and grammar and things like this, um, the, these are evolving systems. Uh, and um, as soon as you learn it, you have to relearn it. And the thing about um, these kinds of facts, in my opinion, such as language facts, is that they have to be lived facts. They can't be just um, isolated facts. They have to, you have to actually live these kinds of things, such as words and grammar and communication. Yes. So Amanda, uh, Jessica just asked, how might we draw the experience of the social brain? I think that's a great question. Let's all take yep. a minute and try to draw the experience of the, of the social brain. Yep, I love it. Um, we're not, this, that, I actually, thank you so much, Jessica, that's a really great, and we will start looking in a second, but there are two things that I want to say, because it's, 
um, about eight minutes too. One is, um, hopefully you made it to the Plexus Institute site and Plexus has a um, every other week complexity newsletter. And so you can sign up on the Plexus Institute site around issue uh, for inf uh, information and update um, ideas about complexity. And um, the uh, other is that we would love for you to tweet yeah. some of the drawings that you did and the hashtag, and I'm gonna put it up here in the chat, the hashtag is, um, one is why Plexus, and the other is Plexus Drawn. And we would love to have you tweet out um, under both um, hashtags. Can you repeat those, please? Um, I'm putting it right now into the chat. One is Plexus Drawn, and the other is why Plexus. And those are both um, Twitter hashtags that we've been tracking. Um, anybody want to start with their image? Oh, there it is on Amanda's hand is also, um, there it is, Plexus drawn and why Plexus. Does anybody want to, um, show up and I think I'll leave, turn this over to you, Amanda, to kind of run this. Cool. In that sense, since I'm up, I will start. <laughs> um, so my, my, uh, this piece to the right here um, is kind of what I was thinking about when I thought about the, the social brain. And for me, that experience, there is some sort of core of me still, which maybe isn't here, but then there's also you know, all these things that just are like popping out in different ways and pulling me back and pulling me around a little bit. So it's not so much an experience of being like a whole thing, but as like literally like things are popping and moving out and around. Yeah, that was my, my take. Jump in if you want to share. So and I'll jump in once. I, I have um, a, a, a little drawing here. Uh, wait, wait. Can you see this? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the the side with the squiggles is what I call the social brain. Mm -hmm. And I, I have actually introduced people at meetings by saying, um, um, "This person actually um, owns part of my brain." Um, <laughs> And, and, uh, and that's, but what I have to share with you is a, something that I'm not all that um, proud of, and that is the other side of my brain is absolutely system-based, and it's, I, I try to learn from the social side of my brain, putting it across, and, uh, and this comes from my, 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 the culture that I've come from, and the sort of medical side, which is almost, I need to get this organized so that I can write an exam about it. And so I, tr I do try to pull things across and I keep telling myself that maybe I shouldn't do that at all. This is a struggle that's not worthwhile. Um, and and it, it also reminded me of my disappointment of the week last week was attending a, a medical student tutorial when uh, a student was asked at the end, did, what, what did they learn from this? And the medical student said, well, from now on, I'm going to make sure that everything I say to a patient, I have evidence for. <gasps> and it was the most, I, I, I felt that throughout the entire week. I felt that, you know, we are really going backwards. Hmm. So since I kind of generated the question, Phil felt to do the drawing, this is a fish um, swimming with the current. So the fish aren't particularly aware of the current, but they all seem to be going kind of in the same direction. And so I think one of the keys to the social brain is that none of us is actually in charge. And we have to, um, and to a certain extent, we're all, 
kind of follow currents and we do come up with consensus about what words mean and even what the word current means. Mm -hmm. And uh, even um, extensions of current like to electrical current and things that flow, the current of conversation. So uh, as, these, as these things evolve, we can't stand alone. We have to um, evolve with it together and we can't really uh, tell a whole group, sorry, that's not what this word means. I'm not going with you guys. We kind of do it together, and I think it's um, fantastic that we do it a little bit unconsciously. Awesome, thank you. Sweet. So we only have, someone gonna jump in, last one? There we go, mine's up. Awesome. Brilliant. So we only have a couple more minutes here um, and I uh, would love for folks to pop in a comment um, sort of on you know, what's your, maybe your takeaway of what you're walking away with in the chat. It would be really great to, to hear that. Um, and a big reminder, if you didn't give us your email yet um, and want to be continue with these conversations, uh, please do so in the chat. And thank you. Seriously, this has been a lot of fun and um, I'm excited to have opened the conversation to a larger group of folks who are interested. So if anybody else wants to pop there if you just make a noise and pop your thing up for the last thing you draw we could just take a look i appreciated how nancy sort of shared and didn't have words yeah so definitely um check out the plexus website too and um, make sure that you know if you're interested in the newsletter it's a seriously awesome thing and barb and i will be um, doing some blogging together and, and to sort of continue this conversation in that space, um, as well as whatever else will come, it's emerging. So we're, we're excited about that. So. Thank you. You have to run. Cheers. Awesome. And we're here. So if you yeah. still want to talk, we'll, we're here for a little while. Just, we did say, you know, an hour. And yep. so. Definitely. I have a couple more minutes. I have to I'll out, but thank you so much for guiding engaging conversation it was really fascinating to see so many different points of view and talk about brain science something I'm really fascinated with and interesting um, to pull into my work and you know, just feeling really inspired thank you cool I'd love to do this again if you continue doing me it's fun I echo just echo just what Aaron said, but also, I you know you guys come from a different planet than I do, and I, <laughs> I, I really enjoy the, uh, the, the, the the these 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 hours together. My, my takeaway is really, um, you know, that very short conversation. Which I'd love to hear more about about uh, when he talked about data, then the emotions, and the perceptions, and the motivation. And I'm, uh, in in our area, I'm thinking of. Uh, a book by Teresa Amabile, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, from, from her research. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh God, wh whenever I mention this in my medical circumstances, I see the eyes rolling, you know, and uh, they're always asking, oh, what is he smoking today, you know? Um, uh, but um, I still struggle on, and I thank you very much for uh, ac accepting me in your conversations. First, um I think I think it's really important too to have all the folks here in the room so often too, right? We want the folks who do mm -hmm. some eye rolling sometimes, and as much as that, I feel that emotionally sometimes as well. I think it's really important for the to have sort of the whole as well. And so I'm always trying to remind myself of that, and really appreciate spaces like this one where I think a lot of us you know, came thinking about that. And I appreciated how Barb was like, yeah, I'm not feeling what you're drawing. It's like, okay. 
um, and that's that's part of it, right? Yeah. So I have, if if it's okay to bring up a related subject, I have a question for Barb and Amanda. Mm -hmm. Is that all right to? Sure, yeah. go for it. Yeah, go for it. So um, this part of my brain, uh, Denise was responsible for. <laughs> And then she asked me uh, because I was contemplating and I gave a pop up on math and and um, complexity and language and all that because I had noticed that in reading complexity um, science articles, a lot of people were using some of the same language and some of the same um, kinds of mathematical formulas. I'm going to turn around and get my power cord because I'm about ready to run out of battery, but I'll continue talking. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, one of the so what I did was I in in contemplating these different formulas, they seem to fall into kind of like three categories in which I've developed kind of a mind map that I haven't put out there yet. Uh, but the three categories of information processing, whether it be data, possibly art, possibly language, and things like and all information is a, um, a way of um, making a prediction, which um, there's different formulas like Bayesian and free energy and associative plasticity. Uh, so any complex adaptive system has to have a way of making a good prediction. Uh, a complex adaptive system has to be able to select a path to move and then also complex adaptive systems always come in groups and so it has to have a process of reaching consensus whether this be through quorum uh, quorum sensing or some of the other mathematical formulas out there now being a believer that it's not just math math is not the only language that we might use to find our way in complexity it would also be language and art I mean, if you look at, particularly if you look at art and see how art has evolved over the centuries, you know, from this kind of art to pointillism, to, and then that led to a different kind of art and music, they all seem to evolve um, one from the other. I started to put some concepts to these things where the predictive, um, um, predictive, um, uh, complex. So, if you look at a um, at the whole system as a story, complex adaptive system of uh, the individual um, complex agent in the system uh, might be the character in the story, and the pathfinding might be the might be the uh, um, the character development, and the consensus might be the plot because you have all these other kinds of these agents interacting within the environment of the story to make sense of the whole thing. And you know, stories are, are not that good unless they actually make sense. A nonsensical story is, is kind of a thing. And I was con wondering if there was something, and this is um, very speculative, but is there, do you see any kind of similar thing with uh, like an, an individual artists having a particular maybe like character and then choosing a path and then working with others in community to create a consensus about paths and then learning from each other how do you see art as uh, playing into that small question hmm. Because art does evolve, you know. So how does so how so are so are there some pieces that are kind of universal to the to the evolution of art? Um, do you have an individual who creates a character, and then they have to choose how they evolve that character, and then but characters cannot exist in isolation; they have to exist in community. So, how do artists? Is there some evolutionary process where artists create community, and that causes further evolution of the characters within the art community? 
but definitely art is dependent on conversation that anytime there was um a breakthrough change in art it was artists looking at the work of other art what's nice about art is that the conversation can be fresh even looking at you can you can time travel and your conversations in a different way than if you're going to carry on a conversation in philosophy even if you choose to address say aristotle you can't you can't have that conversation with aristotle without also knowing all of the other conversations up until this moment that people have had with aristotle that's also true of art you would be seen as an absolute amateur if you didn't know all those other conversations between say um cave paintings and where we are now or between impressionism and where we are now and it shows up in your art if you don't know it a, a trained eye will see that immediately but um i think that there's something about being able to engage directly in conversation that is different. And that's a vague answer, but I think that you are able to have a direct conversation with people from the past that is different than today's conversation. I'm not sure. How did that land, Amanda? Um, to some of it, I think made total sense, and and I, it's interesting. Barbara and I have been working on a bunch of blog posts that we've been throwing back and forth, and um, you know, thinking about the different perspective and how you know i mean a, a little bit of what you're asking is is what what is there a core that we're continuing through art right and to me i almost go no <laughs> it's a complex system to some degree right that mm -hmm. for me artist is and and art and my art is very much dependent on a whole bunch of things granted sure i've been quote unquote trained and have have some art schooling so to speak but I wonder, like to me, it's, it's, there's a bit of a, to go back and use what we talked about before, there's a bit of a social brain in that. And there is also, there's also that sort of individual artist brain. <laughs> there's almost an artist brain that's slightly different too, in the way that we find ways to see one thing in a lot of different ways and to me it's a little bit about pushing boundaries often and so when i start pushing the boundaries of what something actually is then i start pushing the boundary of the perspective even and of feeling and of i take it to another level where things are no longer in this is a math container and this is an English container and this is a character container and this is a plot container because those containers, I, they're, for, the, for that time of processing that, they kind of don't exist because I'm in flow. Mm -hmm. It's, I just had a little bit of an insight in that artists really are trained to shift perspective um we see edge we see volume we see shadow we see line we're literally taught to shift how we are seeing so that this is visual artists so that we we know that we have different tools that we can choose at a moment and so we're constantly choosing which tool right now for this moment and so in the scientific paradigm you're you're getting much deeper into a single path as a group that there can be a whole lot more alignment because 
you're not having to say that reality is constantly shifting. Whereas I think artists are trained, that's part of our basic training is that reality is your choice. Mm -hmm. And so we know that now from, um, oh God, he's in Texas and I can't remember his name right now, but there's a neurologist who talks about, you know, reality is the film that you create in your mind. But for artists, we really are choosing our, our, our perception tool and we are trained to choose our perception tool. And there's a benefit in that because we can shift quickly. And that may be a way that artists are really valuable in a complexity initiative because we can help that shift. Yeah, totally. And I, I, I'm just gonna, uh, I haven't shut the recording off yet. And so, cause I knew there would be a little insight that came out of that. And so I'm gonna say thanks for those of you who are following along with the recording and uh, we're gonna jump on until next time, so.